And continue his praise to the Most High Yah, King of Heaven and Earth, even the God of our forefathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzchak, and the God of Israel. Tim and Tim Malona, all due praises, brothers and sisters. We thank you for joining us for our Torah study. We are Congregation Shomri Hapri, and we are the Keepers of the Covenant. We give thanks, praise to the Most High Yah for all things, for everything. You've been blessing us as we enter into our Holy Shabbat day, and even for bringing you here for our Torah study. Brothers and sisters, for this evening, for our Torah study, you will find us even speaking about the topic, the question of when. The question of when, brothers and sisters, ask ourselves, when is it time to move? When is it time to pray? When is it time to separate? When is it time to unite? When is it time to make a change? Oftentimes, as a people, as we find ourselves, even in these days and times, trying to find Elohim, trying to edify ourselves to a point where we can be righteous without being overly righteous, that brothers and sisters, we have to begin to challenge ourselves to understand when. And so as we begin this evening, our lesson will focus on the chapters of our Holy Scriptures, even the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8 all the way into chapter five. And we're gonna talk about when Elisha had a servant and how the servant was a good servant and then the servant became a bad servant. And the things that we all have to deal with, when we have things that present themselves to ourselves, when we have things that present themselves to us in our lives. So that being understood, brothers and sisters, I thank you for joining us once again. Let us get started with our prayer. Can everyone please rise and face the east and let us begin our Torah study. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. We give honor and praise unto you, Yah, God of the heavens, the God of our forefathers, even the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzchak, and the God of Israel. We give you thanks, praise for all things, for everything, even for blessing us on this holy Shabbat day, and for blessing us concerning our Torah study. We ask this day that you bless us with the spirit of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. We ask this day that as we reach out to others, that you will cause us to speak to them in a way that is right and good, that the words might be understandable, in order that they might get closer to you. Therefore, we ask that your holy scriptures be even magnified in our eyesight. Have it to be that we might even understand righteousness and how to perform it, sin and how to stay far away from it. We also ask this night, as we search for you, that you cause us to understand how to be better people before you. Please forgive us for all of our sins. Teach us how to deal with our brother as well as our sister. Teach us how to honor our father as well as our mother. Have it to be that we might honor you in the sanctuary at and also honor you in our day-to-day -day activities. 
have it to be that we might uplift your most high, your most holy name, and we might do your work and have it to be that we might never ignore your signs, your wonders, and even all the things that you do for us in our lives. We call upon you because we realize that you are Elohim and Elohim alone and that beside you there is no other. All glory, honor, and praises unto your name now forevermore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Brothers and sisters, please be seated. And we give continuous praise unto the Most High Yah, King of Heaven and Earth, even the God of our forefathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzchak, and the God of Israel. To him and to him alone are all due praises. All right, brothers and sisters, so the question of when, and the question of when starts within faith. You know, the question of when not only exists inside of faith, but outside of faith. All right, I want us to keep this in mind because there will be a question of when for you in your lifetime. When is the time to pray? When is the time to wait? When is the time to move? You know, it's like sit still, right? And it's easy for you to tell me to sit still when the urges within me tell me to move. It's easy for you to tell me to wait on God when the situations are presented to you and not to me. And some decisions, brothers and sisters, don't always necessarily afford us time. And so oftentimes what we teach and something that I teach, believe that God will allow the right outcome to happen. Well, that works in part. I tell us all the time, Abraham didn't wait on God. He reacted. He found out that his nephew was kidnapped. He went and got his men together and he went and saved his nephew, right? We see that he didn't wait on God. Jacob understood that there was something that he needed done, right? In his life. And although he consulted God many times, many times over, the reality is brothers and sisters, he got himself to a point. He got himself to a point where he said to himself, okay, listen, this is what I have to do. This is how I have to move, right? They didn't wait. Even his mother didn't wait. Go in, my son. Let that curse be upon me. All right. I want us to keep that in mind as we talk about all these different things, because as we find ourselves in these different spaces and in these different places and doing these different things, what happens to us in our lifetimes when we ask ourselves, when? There's a reality that you had to ask yourself the question, is it time to listen to somebody new? Is it time? to start to hear a different message for my own fulfillment. And I'm not talking about fulfillment in a way that has to do with self-gratification or some level of personal gratification from others. But I'm talking about that you have to get filled in a sense that you got to hear a different voice in order that you stay with God. See, oftentimes our first teachers about God are our parents. They're the very people around us. I want us to keep that in mind. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that as you find yourself dealing in certain times and in certain situations, that you will question what people bring to you. Why do we call upon God? Why do we pray? Why do we do this so many times? Why do we dress the way we dress? But what about when it's time to make a difference? You know, Abraham was called away from his family. Am I right or am I wrong? When he was called away from his family, he had to ask himself the question of when. When is the time? I know God told me to leave from this place, but when is the time? When is the time now or is it in a few years? Maybe God is telling me now, but it's not exactly now. 
And I tell us this, and I want us to keep this in mind, because as our parents taught us different things, then the question of when became, do I now challenge their understanding? Were you ever ready to challenge somebody's understanding about God? Were you, not that you were ready to challenge them, not that you were ready to, to come up against them, but listen, I need to understand more about this Passover. Because I heard you saying this, but this doesn't add up to me. I want to understand what you're saying about this dress code, Moray, because this doesn't sound like it's adding up. I want to know when it's time to walk through the door. Should I be involved in this service or should I be involved in that service? When is the time for me to get closer to God? What is the overwhelming understanding amongst our people of when it's time to get closer to God? I'm going to answer it for you. When you're in trouble. When you sin. When you need something. Come on. There's one more. Overwhelm. When you're confused. You just don't know. Clarity. I agree. How about when you die? How about the older you get? Is there understanding that as the older you get, the closer you should get to God? And if there is, why is that understanding prevalent? And I want us to think about that. I want us to keep that in mind. Because as we find ourselves going through these different things, as we find ourselves in these different spaces, it is the idea that the older I get, the closer to God I'm going to become. But did not Elohim say to us, serve him in your youth? Before, before the days draw near, right? He's letting us know and he wants us to keep in mind that this is the time and this is the season. So I tell us this and I want us to keep all of this in mind because as we find ourselves in these situations, you will always be challenged with these different things. When is the time to pray? The morning as well as the afternoon. Don't wait to get in trouble. Don't wait till you're feeling sick. Now is the time. That is the question to the that is the question to the when. What are you waiting on? Should I wait? Should I go and just jump and get a new teacher? Or should I just wait and find out what I can glean from this teacher? Sometimes there's people who move too fast, right? Sometimes there's people who wait too long. Am I right? So the question of when. It's not as simple as, oh, yes, this, this, oh, but the question of when is a discretion question. And I want us to keep that in mind. The question of when being a discretion question, because you have to use your righteous discretion to stop and say, do I have enough? Brothers and sisters, learn to follow the course. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, what we find ourselves doing is we find ourselves in positions of dealing with our feelings and dealing with our temptations and dealing with our urges because I have the temptation to ascend. So I want to go and be part of this. Or I am tempted to read other books. So I want to go and I want to go and do this. But you don't necessarily need to do that. I am tempted to go make a lot of money. We're going to read that in a little while in the chapters that we talk about. And so I am going to be willing to get that money however possible. But even the most I told us, he said, riches given by unjust gain will not prosper, right? Goes on to say that in the book of Proverbs. I want you to keep that in mind. So I'm telling us this and I want us to keep that in mind because as we go through these things, I'm going to bring out a few points to us. Now, I first told us, trusting in God is easier said than done, especially, especially when you have a lot to lose. 
trusting in God, let me say it again, is easier said than done, especially when you have a lot to lose. And I'm not telling you not to trust in God. And I'm not telling you that you should take your time trusting in God. I'm telling you that when you have a lot to lose and somebody comes and tells you, just wait, God will take care of it. The things going through your mind is definitely not just wait. Imagine your home about to be foreclosed on, right? Imagine that your all your assets are about to be seized. I want you to think about that. Then what happens, right? Imagine having to make a decision about a body part, a major decision. And you're sitting down and you're talking to the doctor and something must be done immediately. Is that something that you want to wait on? Waiting for a sign? Is that something that you like, oh, somebody's going to come through the door and answer right now? I'm not saying God can't do it. I'm saying I want you to be practical with yourselves because God gave us brains for us to use. Sometimes God has already given us the answer and you're listening to somebody to tell you, wait, that has told you, wait. Sometimes the question of when is learning when to listen to advice and learning when somebody is giving you bad advice. When somebody's telling you something for themselves, I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, that there are times that there are people who are attempting to live vicariously through you. They're making decisions based on what they would have done if they had the opportunity again. And so now they are trying to force you to make decisions that they would have made even though they're not living your life. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? I want you to keep it in mind. Oh, listen, don't, 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 don't go with that sister. Leave that sister alone because all she's going to do to you is. Don't go with that brother because all they're going to do to you is. You see it happen to you every day. I don't want you to go to that place of worship because at that place of worship, this is all that's going to happen to you. I don't want you to listen to that teacher because if you listen to this teacher, this is all he's going to say to you. I don't want you to think that you got to do all of those laws that are in that book because I did all of those laws and this is what's going to happen when you do all those things. And so that's what you call being attacked on many different levels. That's what you call many different things happening to you at once. And the question of when becomes, when are you as an individual going to understand what you need to do and how you need to go about it? Sometimes those decisions are based on you. Sometimes those decisions are based on your study. Sometimes those decisions are based on you paying attention to the things happening around you. Sometimes those things are based on you anticipating the moment. Let's talk a second about anticipating the moment. I want you to learn to anticipate Elohim the same way you anticipate getting paid. You know when you're about to get paid. You know when you're about to get a check that's going to clear that you're going to have the money in your bank account. You know, there, there's people who anticipate their tax return. They know what they're going to do with it. They know how they want to spend that money. They know that that money is there for a particular purpose. You have anticipated it. There are people who are antic anticipating a big payday because they know the work that they have put into it. They know that this is the amount of money that it's going to yield because of the work that they have done. Do you anticipate Elohim the same way? Do you anticipate your blessing the same way? When do you get to the point? If not, if you're not there, when do you get to the point when you anticipate Elohim that way? 
And I tell us this, and I want us to keep this in mind, because as we find ourselves doing these different things, brothers and sisters, we find ourselves in a space that you as an individual are not preparing yourself for the best as well as the worst. You have to prepare yourself for your prayer to thank God. You have to prepare yourself for your prayer to ask God for forgiveness. You have to prepare yourself in such a way that your prayer comes forth and say, God, heal me now. Oftentimes, brothers and sisters, we find ourselves sidetracked because God has become the afterthought to us as opposed to our primary thought. What we find ourselves doing is we find ourselves in a space that as time is going on and as we're going through the different things that we're going through, it says, I have received and now I will give God. But the question of when asks us, am I properly doing this in a manner that is acceptable before Elohim? Do I receive then pray or do I pray then receive? The question of when. Do I ask, then receive, or do I receive, then ask? You might say, more right, that doesn't make sense. Do I ask and receive? Do I ask? Do I, do I ask for what I want and then receive it? Or do I receive what I want and then ask for forgiveness? I should have been thinking you this whole time, Elohim. Because you've been answering my prayers before I even thought about it. You've been answering my prayers and I didn't even realize I should be calling upon you. I have years that I didn't ask God for all of these things. And then now I find myself in a space and in a place, brothers and sisters, that I need to have ask God for forgiveness because I should have been thanking him all along. See, what happens is life comes around with perspective. I want you to keep that in mind. When, you, when we're children, we don't understand how to keep God in a place where we appreciate him because we don't, we don't know enough about him. We haven't experienced enough about him. We have been children and we've dealt in such a manner, brothers and sisters, that as we were hearing different things and as we were going through different things, we thought life was just supposed to give us what we wanted. We found ourselves in a space that we thought that as kids, I am supposed to be fed. I am supposed to feel good. I'm supposed to wake up and just start doing things. I'm never supposed to not get what I want. I'm never not supposed to get what God has asked me for. Excuse me, I'm never not supposed to get what I have asked God for because I am here. And then as life goes on, we learn appreci appreciation. As life goes on, brothers and sisters, what do we learn? We learn that there are things that are not automatically afforded to us. So when that happens, when that happens, the question of when, when do you say to yourself, okay, I owe Elohim a little bit more? When do you say that? When does that happen? Does that happen for you in a way that you're like, okay, yes, no problem? Or does that happen for you in a way where you just say, ah, I'll think about it? See, I'm going to tell you something about appreciation. Appreciation only happens, brothers and sisters, when we find ourselves in a space where we could look at what we were given and know that we didn't deserve it. How many times have you been given something that you don't deserve? I'm telling you, some of you right now find yourself in a space and in a place, brothers and sisters, that you could look at something earlier today and say, I didn't really deserve that. You could look at what happened in the last year, say, I didn't really deserve that. You know, there are people in this world that have children that are really good to them, that 
they haven't been good too. Does that make sense to you? That they haven't been good too. And they say, hmm, wow. You know what? I don't deserve this type of child. I don't deserve this type of treatment because they've been better to me than I have to them. Do y'all realize that there's people like that? At that point, when you're dealing with that, and at that point, when you're going through that, I want you to ask yourself the question, and I want you to be honest with yourself. I want you to be quite honest with yourself. Is that not the time to pray to God? Is that not the time to begin to change? Do y'all understand what I'm saying? That has to be the time to change. That has to be the time that things get better for you. Not, and I want you to understand this, brothers and sisters, not just because you see it happening, but the fact that you appreciate it. Coming to find God is not a short process. Coming to find God is a long process. You found God throughout the steps and stages of your life. Some of you have found God as a child. Some of you have found God as a teenager. Some of you have got, found God as a young adult. And some of you are finding God as elders. Do we understand that? And so when we find ourselves in those spaces and in those places, I want us to understand this. And I want us to keep this in mind, right? As all of those things begin to happen, the reality is that God has been calling you all along. How many people understand about God's calling? God knew that you didn't appreciate him and he still did it anyway. He still did it anyway because he knew you would learn to appreciate it. I want you to think about that. God knew and he understood, brothers and sisters, that you were dealing with something and something was in your mind that would eventually sprout. It would eventually come forth. There will be something in your spirit that would make you say, you know what? I need to do things differently. I want you to keep that in mind. Brothers and sisters, you have been dealing with Elohim in such a way that you thought that God would always be there for you. But the reality is you understood that there were times where God was not there for you. And so now we understand and we learn to appreciate that there are times in our lives that God is closer to us than others. There are some times where God is not as close to us. The signs aren't coming as much. And you know what? That's when we remember those times. We recollect upon those times, brothers and sisters, that as that's happening, we say to ourselves, you know what? Let me sit down and wait. Let me be still. Because God has shown that he'll get me through it each and every time. And that's what happens to us. That's the reality of it all. That's how all of these things pan themselves out. I want you to keep that in mind. The way all of these things pan themselves out is that they find themselves in a space and in a place that you realize that I don't need to worry like that because God always works these things out. It has always happened for us. It, it always works out like that. But you need to experience God first. You need to see how God is with you time and time again. There may have been times that you have questioned God. Have you ever questioned God, brothers and sisters? Oh, yeah. And when you question God, what, what, did, what did that do for you? you? You questioned him, but did you feel necessarily good about it? I'm like, uh-huh. Why am I questioning God right now? I'm questioning God because I don't know. I'm questioning God because I need an answer. But I know I shouldn't be questioning Elohim. And that becomes the thing for us. I know I shouldn't be questioning Elohim, but I am questioning Elohim. 
And so when that happens, and when you find yourself in a space, you don't think God knew you would question him? You don't think God knew that you needed a wake-up call, you needed a tap on the shoulder, you needed a refresher? He was, oh, oh. He knew there's, there's only a matter of time. You will question me. There's only a matter of time. I'm going to allow this person to change on you. I am going to show you exactly who this person is. How many people can testify this day that God has showed you somebody that you didn't realize who they were? God has showed you somebody that was against you and you didn't even realize it. You welcome them into your home. You help them do things. You lend them some money. You were there for them through the thick and the thin. And then eventually they showed their true colors. And what happened? It hurt your heart. It hurt your spirit. It hurt your soul. It made you question yourself and your actions. It made you question your character. It made you question your personality. It made you question all of those things. And then what happened? As those things happened, brothers and sisters, somebody had to come along. The teacher had to come forth. It's, it's not your personality. It's not your character. You're not doing anything wrong. You're not being repaid for some old sin. You've already paid for that. What's happening to you is what you need to understand is, and I want you to keep this in mind, what you're dealing with right now, I'm showing you who's around you. I'm revealing to you exactly what's going on. Don't worry about that. I'm revealing to you what you need to know so you can separate yourself before things get worse. How many of us need it for God to save us from situations? Amen. How many of us need it for God to show us a way because we were thinking about doing something unrighteous? Mm -hmm. And that in itself becomes problematic. I want us to keep that in mind and I want us to know of everything that's happening, brothers and sisters, that God is dealing with us in such a way that he'll reveal it to you. He'll let you know he's separating things from around you. You're just questioning when, when will God appear to me? When will God give me the sign? Does God want me to make this move? Do I need to hear the word of God? Well, I'm here to tell you this day, brothers and sisters, that there are things, there are things that's happening around you that are already in place that have nothing to do with you. Don't worry about that. There are things that are happening around you, brothers and sisters, that have nothing to do with the fact that you haven't been to service 18 times in the last year, 26 weeks in a year, and you haven't been there 18 times. Don't worry about that. Get yourself in service. The time is now. Passover is approaching. Am I right or am I wrong? When Passover is approaching, I want you to ask yourself the question. Is that the time to walk through the door? Is that the time to start serving God? Your answer should be yes. Even if you haven't been there, three times in a year shall all males appear and none of them shall appear empty. But remember all souls, there's a, everybody should be observing the Passover. So I tell us this and I want us to keep this in mind because as we find ourselves dealing with the different things that we're dealing with, there is a reality, brothers and sisters, that our blessing lies in our action, not in our inaction. And so I say that because with inaction 
becomes disappointment. With action comes the blessing. Stop expecting that your inactivity will yield the fruit of a blessing. It doesn't work like that. Stop expecting that just because you believe it in your mind, that that will be enough to give you everything that you need. There is the totality of it all. I'm giving that to us and I want us to keep that in mind because I want us to talk for a minute before we get into our scriptures about what happens when. What happens when we acknowledge that we have been blindly following a person or an organization? What happens at that point? Somebody tell me. Feel like you wasted your time? You begin to question the things that you've learned? Can you question God in that instance? Why did God send me here? Or why did God allow me to go through all these things? Was God showing me the signs all along and I simply wasn't paying attention? That's what happens. Sometimes we ask ourselves the question, when we find what we're looking for, how come God didn't show me this all along? How come he didn't open my eyes? It's always a way that we can question God. I want you to keep that in mind. And so I want you to keep that in mind because as we find ourselves going through these different places and spaces, don't, do not find yourself upset at the fact that, hey, I, I followed this organization and it was wrong. Sometimes God, that's that's the gateway for you. Sometimes God gives you what you're comfortable with so he can lead you to some place that you would otherwise be uncomfortable. Sometimes God allowed somebody to teach you who could speak to you on terms that you could relate to until you could get to the point where you can relate to the information that's in the book. Sometimes your teacher is better than the space that you're in and you need time to be ready for your teacher. You don't go from kindergarten to college, do you? Who does that? You don't go from the the seventh grade to uh, applying for your doctorate, do you? That's not how it goes. That's not how those things find themselves. No, rather so, brothers and sisters, you find yourself in a space that you have to grow spiritually page by page, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse. That's what ends up happening with you. I want you to understand that you may ask yourself the question, what was my purpose when I was there? You may ask yourself, do I have a purpose now? Because God didn't want me there then, so what is God doing with me now? And then you may ask yourself the question, did I miss the purpose the most High was trying to show me? He had to be showing me something there. It had to be something happening that God wanted me in that place or he wouldn't have sent me there. But sometimes learn to accept what you have. Your plate is your plate. I want you to understand that the lemons that life gives you, either you will make lemonade or you will have your sour pus face because of the way the raw lemon tastes. I want you to keep that in mind because as you learned, you met people. Sometimes God may be bringing you to a place because he wants somebody in that place to see you. Not that he wants you there. Sometimes God is bringing you to places because guess what? Your future husband is there. Your future wife is there. And guess what? They've been asking themselves the question, is it time for me to leave the place? Not that you were sent to the place to go into the place and go, 
oh, this place is horrible. Y'all need to get out of here. But know that you went into the place and that somebody seen you and it started with a simple conversation. Um, Can I ask you a question? Yes. Where do you go to service? Oh, well, I go to this place. I mean, I usually visit around, but I go to this place. Um, You know, the, the Hebrew family of Charlotte, I, I like what they're doing. They've always been kind to me. Um, every time I come through the door, I've learned, you know, these different things. And that's my congregation. But I figured I'd just visit over here right now to show love to different brothers. All right, can you give me the address? And what happens? Why am I telling us this? Because that's how you network. That's how you build. That's how you grow in God. And then you realize you're like, oh, well, over here, they, they do this this way. But over here, they do this this way. You know, this is how they do their prayers. But I like the way they do their prayers. And, you know, that brother, when he says those prayers, he has that kind of zing to it that I like. Right. And as a result, you become exposed to different things. As a result of you being exposed, it makes you a more well-rounded person. You see, I like the way they go into the history. I like the way that they go into the Proverbs. They go into the Proverbs every week. Oh, okay. And so it's okay. It is okay for us to have multiple places of worship. You know why? Because we all make each other better. But you got to want to make each other better. This, this idea, brothers and sisters, of when. Sometimes you have to know when to go back home. Let me say that one more time. Sometimes you have to know when to go back home. I liked it over here. I liked the different things that were hap was happening. But you know, Shomri Habrit, more Yiftak, he has a way of giving us these things that he is always reminding us that we have to remain accountable for what we do. So you know what? I'm coming back for a while. I'm gonna I'm gonna get some more of that fulfillment before I go back out. I I like more Ray because he doesn't have me beholden to the place. He always tells me, make sure that you're spreading the word of God no matter where you are. And I like that. I like leaders that are reasonable. I like leaders that are judgmental, but non-judgmental, right? He's going to tell us to be, he's going to hold us accountable. But at the same time too, he's like, listen, there's a pathway back because God has created the sin offering. God has created what? Our day of atonement. So I say that. Because I want us to know, as I have in my notes, we have to learn that knowledge doesn't exist in one book. We have to learn to, that knowledge doesn't exist with one person. It exists in the entire world. Even when you think something is bad, there's something to learn from it. Even when you think that there's something great, you may find something wrong there. And so what does it teach us? Take the good as well as with the bad. So when that happens, I often talk to us about studying the Holy Scriptures. When that happens, I often talk to us and remind us, brothers and sisters, that there are other books to glean knowledge from. But then the question becomes, when do I go into the Apocrypha? And I'll tell you far and in between, right? I want you studying Torah. I want you to be based in Torah. But then you go, well, can I get into the Apocrypha? When is what, what Old Testament are you talking about? Am I reading the King James Version? Am I reading the, 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 the NIV? Am I reading Young's Version? Right? Am I reading any of these versions? ESV. All these different versions of the Holy Scriptures. What, what version of it should I be reading, right? And then after that, should I read the New Testament? And I'll tell you no. You go, well, what about the book of Yashar? What about the book of Enoch? What about the book of Jubilees? 
What about the Zohar? What about, um, you know, the Talmud? And which Talmud should I be reading? And speaking of the Apocrypha, which Apocrypha should I be reading? And I've heard about all these different things. And I will tell you the question of when. I want you to stay grounded in Torah. And after you're grounded in Torah, brothers and sisters, then, then you can begin to branch out and understand about different religions. The Torah will give you, take you in many different directions. The Torah will teach you about different units of measurements. We learn that in our temple and different things that are there. The Torah will also teach you, brothers and sisters, about what? The Torah will teach you about geographical locations. Where is Israel? Where is Ethiopia? Where is Egypt? Where is Cush? Where is Seba? Right? Where is Assyria? Right? Where is the land of what? The Philistines. We learn about these different things. Where is the Sea of Reeds, which they refer to in these days and times as what? The Red Sea. Where are these things? Where do they take place? The, the Holy Scriptures teaches us about nations of the earth. Who are these ancient people? Right? I want us to keep this in mind. Who are the Moabites? Who are the Ammonites? Who are these Edomites that we, that we speak of? Right? Who is Gog? Who is Magog? Ashur is Assyria. But when you hear about the Ashurim, what is happening there? Where are these ancient nations and where are they from? And so I say there's a world of things you can do before you start getting into these other books. And I tell us this and I want us to keep this in mind because as you find yourself getting into those other books, brothers and sisters, there is a there is a fact that you can begin to confuse yourself. So as I always do, I want us to I want to give us a scripture and I want to give us the book of Hosea chapter 4 verse 6. And in the book of Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 and I know 2 Kings is up right now. You you can get there. We're going to start in 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 8. I'm just going to read it. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6. And when we get to this space, all of you have it. I hope you have your holy scriptures with you, brothers and sisters. We're going to read our word and it reads hallelujah. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I also will forget thy children. And so we hear the word and we understand that it's important for us to read. It's important for us to know our history. It's important for us to have knowledge, right? And God has told us that we are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. But as I always teach us, I want us to keep our scriptures hand in hand. And so for that, when we read that, I want us to turn to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 5, and we are going to read verses 12 and 13. And once again, I'm going to read that. Isaiah 5, verses 12 and 13. Let me get my scriptures here. And Isaiah chapter 5, verse 12 reads, Hallelujah, and the harp, and the psaltery the tabret and the pipe and wine are in their feasts. But they regard not the work of Yah. Neither have they considered the operation of his hands. Therefore, my people are going into captivity for what? Want of knowledge. And their honorable men are famished and their multitude are parched with thirst. Right? I like that 13 verse, and I want you to keep that in mind. Because as you find yourself in these spaces and as you find everything that's going on, we see here that the Most High God is already telling us we're going into captivity for want of knowledge. 
He's letting us know that we, in order for us to be a wise and understanding people, we have to have some level of intelligence. Should I go to school? Is school for me? Don't you ever let anybody tell you that school is not for you. Don't ever let anybody tell you reading is not your thing. Of some of the most intelligent men that I've studied in this world, each and every one of them, every single time, said that they read and they read at least one book a week. Each and every time. Marcus Garvey, avid reader. Malcolm X, avid reader. Miles Monroe, who I respect a lot, right? Avid reader. All these things are there. I want us to keep this in mind. Reading not only increases your knowledge, it helps you with your speech, it helps you with communicating to people, it makes you understand how to communicate with people and what resonates with people. And it also expands your vocabulary to a point where you can communicate with anybody in this world. You can communicate with a young child as well as communicate with an elder and make sure you always understand your audience. But the question of when becomes when I'm trying to understand the word of God, if you don't find yourself reading the word of God, how do you expect your spirit to be filled with the spirit of God? How do you expect your body when we talk about Ruach El, when we talk about the spirit of God and allow your Holy Spirit to rest upon me? You imagine the Holy Spirit of God resting on a blank shell. Can you imagine the spirit of God being on a dead body? The spirit of God brings us life. It allows us to understand what we're doing. I'm not shortening the hand of God because I know God can do it. What I am telling you for you is that you need to fill your vessel so that when the spirit of God comes to you, it is ready to be received. Amen. All right. That being understood, brothers and sisters, let us get to a point where we get to our scriptures. We are going to second Kings chapter four, and we're going to go to verse eight. And so I'm going to give us a couple of things before we start. Okay. First thing is we have to consider the things happening around us. All right. You have to consider how God is moving with you. Is God answering your prayers? I want you to understand that you're going to have to begin to consider, brothers and sisters, when God's judgment is in the earth. Is God judging people? Is evil still in the earth? Are there things happening around us? Right? The world in which you live, brothers and sisters, must be questioned. And the question you should be asking yourself is, is this world that I live in sustainable and righteousness? And I want you to stop looking at necessarily everything everybody else is doing. I want you to start with your house. Is this house that I live in sustainable for righteousness? And if it is not, what do I need to do? Sometimes I need to get my family on board. Do y'all understand that? Sometimes I need to get my family on board. Sometimes I need to get my friends on board. Sometimes I need to get my associates on board. I need to make sure that I understand what we're doing. And that doesn't mean this isn't a, a chop slash and shatter type of deal. I to chop, chop off this friend and, and slash this associate and smash this associate over here. No. Sometimes it's, okay, now that I understand that there's some things that need to be fixed, what do I need to do? Do y'all understand what I'm saying? I want you to keep that in mind. Why do I say that? Who are some people that we see in our holy scriptures that had to make decisions to change? Well, my first example to you is King David. Do you remember King David when he was a young man? 
Who did he serve? He served Saul. And as he served Saul, he had to realize that Saul no longer liked him. Have you ever been in a place where you had to look at somebody who you were very good friends with and realize they know they no longer like you? Or people or somebody who is your family member, a brother or a sister who you thought would always be on your side and you realize they're not there for me anymore. And you questioned yourself of when to walk away. David had to question himself of when to walk away. David had to be told by Saul's very son, who he was best friends with, no, my father wants to kill you. It's time to walk away. Have you ever had to be told by somebody that person is no longer your friend? I want you to keep that in mind because this idea that guess what? Things will always work out. Our holy scriptures have proven they don't always work out. David and Saul never made up. It wasn't until the Most High Yah killed Saul that David was able to ascend on the throne. Do we remember Jacob and Esau? And they could never have the same dwelling. Am I right or am I wrong? And for Jacob and Esau, Jacob had to realize that that was his brother. But guess what? His brother never really liked him. Sometimes we have to learn to accept our reality. Jacob, your blessing was called to you from the womb. But no matter what, no matter how hard your mother tried, no matter how hard your father tried, you and your brother would simply never get along. It's how it is. We don't like that, do we? We don't like that type of talk. But sometimes that's reality. That's the part of holding yourself accountable. Stop hoping for something that's never going to happen. Right? We pray that we get past our situations, but I want you to live in the reality that if it doesn't, it's okay. It's okay to move on, all right? But lastly, which becomes the focus of our chapter, what about when Alicia could no longer coexist with Gehazi? Do we know who these two guys are? Alicia, the prophet. He was the servant to the man that we all know as Elijah. And Elijah, we know he's the one that went up in the whirlwind, the chariots of fire. We know he, he got so upset, he thought it was just himself that was the servant of the true and living God. And when he went to meet God in a mountain and he covered his face in his mantle and he put his head between his knees and he spoke to God and God reminded him, he said, I still have 7,000 that have not bowed down to the Baal. And Elisha, your servant, will be the prophet in your stead. And so we look at these things and we remember Elijah because Elijah was the man who didn't die a normal death, just like Enoch didn't die a normal death. And so we look at their deaths as amazing and theologians all across the world. We, we uh, argue, and we debate, and we go back and forth about Elijah and what Elijah went through and why he died the way he died and exactly where did he go, right? And so I tell us to keep that in mind as we go through these different things because I'm here to tell you today that as we look at Elisha and all the miracles he performed because he got what? A double portion of Elijah's spirit. Can you imagine getting a double portion of somebody's spirit? Imagine a double portion of King David's spirit. Imagine a double portion of Moses' spirit. A double portion of Abraham's spirit. How about a double portion of Samuel's spirit? 
Would you take it? Sisters, how many of you would take a double portion of the prophet, prophetess Deborah's spirit? How many of you would take a double portion of Mother Sarah's spirit? Do you understand what I'm saying? Alicia got a double portion of Elijah's spirit, yet he died the regular death of men. So I want us to keep this in mind because Elisha was a good servant to Elijah. But what we're going to learn today is that Gehazi was not a good servant to Elisha. Now, I give y'all the last question. Mm, very good. I give y'all the last question. Can good people turn bad? Yeah, I knew y'all pause on me. I know you be like. The answer is yes. I want you to keep that in mind. Good people can indeed turn bad. Let us turn to our scriptures. We're going to the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 4, and we are going to begin in verse 8. Sorry. Mm -hmm. And our scriptures read, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. So it was that as often as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. Now we're going to keep our scripture there, but I want us to see that this is a part in our scripture where we see there was a great woman. Meaning what? Ishta Gadola. Meaning what? She was rich. Right? There was this Shunammite woman. And within this Shunammite woman, what we see was happening here was she seen this guy passing day by day and she offered him food. She made sure he had something to eat. Right? Come on. Verse 9. And she said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is a holy man of Elohim that passes by us continually. Isn't that interesting? That there was something about the way that Elisha carried himself that she knew that God was with him. Hold on to that thought, brothers and sisters. Verse 10. Let us make, I pray thee, a little chamber on the roof, and let us set for him there a bed, and a table, and a stool, and a candlestick. And it shall be, when he comes to us, that he shall turn in thither. And it fell on a day that he came thither, and he turned into the upper chamber, and lay there. Keep our scriptures there. You know, there's much to be said about hospitality. Because hospitality brings favor. Am I right or am I wrong? She thought about this man passing by. She seen everything that was going on. And she said to her husband. They referred to her as Isha Gadola. They understood her to be the Shunammite woman. But she went and she spoke to her husband. And she said, listen. Let's create a bed. Let's create a room, a chamber, and let's put a bed up there and let's put a candlestick up there. And let's create a place so that he can come and have a place to sit down and have some place to sleep when he's traveling. You know, in these days and times, we have this thing, you know, we catch a bus, right? We catch a, a Uber, you know. We, we, we have things that get us to where we need to go to. We, we catch, what, a quick flight, and we go from point A to point B. But in antiquity, that's not how it worked. And in antiquity, what they had to do was they had to travel for a while. They had to stop, and they had to continue on in their journey. And wherever Alicia was headed, more than likely to the house of the Lord, she said, I see this guy keep passing by. 
He seems to me to be a good guy. There's something about his spirit that shows he's good. Okay, you know what? Let's create a space. Right? So they created that space and, uh, and uh, the upper chamber is there. All right? It says in verse 12. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, call the Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. He said unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? What is thou be spoken of for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. Highlight that verse. You know, the reality is, brothers and sisters, that he's speaking to the woman. But I want us to focus on the fact that Gehazi is the man he sent to give his instructions. Gehazi is his trusted servant. Gehazi is his right-hand man. Alicia has the heir of the king. Alicia has the heir of the captain of the host. And Gehazi, it is his job to go and be a good servant the same way Elisha was to Elijah. So he asked him, he said, what should be done for you? He tells him, she tells him, I dwell among my own people. Meaning what? I'm good with the Shunammites. I, I don't need nothing. I'm not trying to get no business deal here. Oh, okay, really? So what is it indeed that you want? And it goes on to say in verse 14, and he said, what then is it to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, verily she has no son and her husband is old. Now, I want us to consider that because when he says she has no son, how do these men know that this is the desire of this woman? And when he says her husband is old or her husband is an elder, right? What does that mean? That means she feels her window is closing, right? I want you to keep that in mind because Alicia has to listen to what's going on and say to himself, okay, what is it that I need to do? We're going to talk about the spoken word when it's time to pray to God for somebody. The question of when. Verse 15, he said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door. And he said, at this season, Moed, that's that Hebrew word, Moed. At this season, when the time comes around, you shall embrace a son. She said, nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thy handmaid. And the woman conceived and bore a son at that season when the time came around, as Elisha had said unto her. Now, I want you to know that this process of everything that is going on, they are actually going back and forth to this woman's house periodically throughout the year. I want you to know that when people bless people, when people pray in your name, it is as simple as somebody speaking for you in the name of God. This time next year, you're going to get what you want. I want you to know that that has always been a practice for us as a people. May God bless you with the desires of your heart. The prophet had the power in his hand because Elohim allowed it to happen. But he said, at this time next year, thou shalt have a son. I speak to us often about the fact that we are a people that when we read through our scriptures, we have always had some level of infertility issues. 
by something. Just when you think you can't have children, the woman comes along. But there's there's been points where women couldn't have children. And so she didn't want the prophet to lie to her. She told the prophet, don't lie to me. Right? And as you see, the prophet didn't even reply to her. He said, at this time, next year, in its season, you're going to have a child. Do we remember who that happened to? Who else did that happen to? Mother Sarah, right? Did that happen to anybody else? How about Samuel the prophet's mother, right? Oh, we see these things. We see everything that's going on, right? Sarai, as well as a co-F Marine Allen, both got it. We've seen it happen with Mother Sarah. We've seen it happen with Mother Kana. And now we see it happening with this Shunammite woman. Right? So the next season, she got what she wants. Why did she get what she wanted? Somebody tell me that. She got what she wanted because she created a space for the man of God. You see what I talk about when you give? When you give, you receive. Remember I told you? you ask, is it that you ask, then receive? Or is it that you receive, then you ask? Now the beginning of the lesson is, is coming back to us. Now we see how it goes and it intertwines. She didn't ask and then receive. What she did was she... She, what she did was she created the space she received. Brothers and sisters, she didn't create the space because she was like, oh, I'm going to create the space and then God is going to give me a son. She created the space because she knew that's what God would want her to do. And as a result, God paid her for it. I want you to keep that in mind and I want you to bear that in mind for all the different things that you do because as you find yourself dealing in these different spaces and in these different places and everything that's going on, there's one of you that needs your prayers answered today. There's one of you right now that already been doing the work of God. You're only waiting for your time and your season. You're only waiting for the man to run into that will ask the most high to answer your prayers and then it will happen. You've been doing the work. You've already been creating the space for the man of God. The man of God has already asked somebody to ask you what you want. I want you to be reasonable in what you ask for. And I want you to know that God is going to answer your prayers. Because as all these things are going on, Gehazi is a firsthand witness. The servant is a firsthand witness that this man has the power in his hand to call upon God. And it happened. So as you find yourself in that space and as you find yourself in that place of hearing the word of God, know that. There is a point that you will, if you are doing the work of God, know that there is a point that God will send somebody to you. Prepare yourself for that moment. So God has these here. He sees all of this stuff, this stuff going on. The woman has the child that she wants, right? Come on, let's read some more. It says in verse 17, and the woman conceived. And bore a son at that season. When the time came around, as Alicia had said unto her, and when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father to the reapers. When the child was grown. Mm, it's interesting terminology. Right? When the child got bigger, because it was still a child. Right? But when the child got bigger, he went out to his fathers to the reapers. Verse 19. And he said unto his father, My head, my head. And he said to his servant, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, 
He sat on her knees till noon and then died. I like that 20th verse. Because there was something wrong with this child. There was something going on. And I'm going to talk to us in a minute about miracles. There was something that was happening. And all the things that were going on. This woman finally got the child that she wanted. The child not only was born, he grew. He was able to walk by himself. He was able to go out in the field with his father and whatever was going on. There was something that happened in that was happening in his head. He was laying on his mother's knees and he died. And this can be traumatic for any one person, not only the mother, but as well as the father. But imagine what's going through this mother's head because this is the child that she prayed for. This is the child that she felt she earned. This is the child that the prophet spoke and it came to pass and that made her even become stronger in her belief of Elohim. I know that God answers prayers. And the child fell on her knees and died. So as all these things were happening, as we ask ourselves the question of when, when is the time to pray? When is the time to take action? I want you to see what this resilient woman did. Verse 21. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. I want to ask us the question and we can. We can discuss this in question and answer tomorrow. Did she tell her husband that the child was dead? When we read on some more, we'll see some things. Verse 22. And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the servants and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come back. Verse 23. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, it shall be well. Highlight that 23rd verse. Keep that 23rd verse on the screen because I want to take two seconds to talk about this. Her child died and she asked her husband to go see the prophet. And his response was, why are you going to him? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. That is a direct indicator to us. That is a direct indicator to us that our people went to our places of worship on the new moon as well as the Sabbath. That is a direct indication to us that because she asked for the mule. Well, actually not the mule, but because she asked for the ass, right, to travel to see the man that our forefathers indeed did travel on the Sabbath day as well as the new moon. I want you to keep all of these things in mind. Verse 24, then she saddled an ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward, slacken me not the riding, except I bid thee. Right? So she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel. Location. All right? And it came to pass, when the man of God saw how far off, that he said to Gehazi, his servant, Behold, Yana is that Shunammite. Run, I pray thee now, to meet her and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, it is well. Was she lying? Why was she lying to the man of God at this point? Why did she say, it's like, I, I see her coming. Gehazi, go ask her what's going on. She never comes after me. And if, if anything, she would have spoke to me when I was there. We just came from there. I want you to ask her, is it well with her? Is it well with her child? Is it well with her husband? Why? 
because people are not stupid, right? Now, something's going on here. What's happening? I tell us this because when she said to Gahazi, it is well, I tend to believe that this woman was perceptive enough that there was something about Gahazi that she didn't trust. And she told Gahazi, it is well, knowing full well that she needed to speak directly to Alicia about what was going on. Come on, let's read some more. It says in verse 27, when she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught hold of his feet and Gehazi came near to thrust her away. But the man of God said, let her alone for her soul is bitter within her and the Lord has hid it from me and has not told me. Elohim does not always reveal to the prophets what we think he does. He doesn't tell everybody all of his plans. God, God had indeed struck the child and the child died. But guess what? Elisha was humble enough to understand that not all the time does God show me what's going on. I'm taking a second to talk about this because I want you to know that your leaders can't always answer your questions. Your chief men can't always answer your questions. The prince can't always answer your question. The priest can't always answer your question. The more can't always answer your question. You, you, are sometimes going to have to go one-on-one -on -one with God. Go and meet with somebody, talk with them, but then after a while, you indeed have to jump to action. The question of when. Let, leave her alone. I can look at her face and I can tell something is going on. That's what happens with us sometimes. I want us to understand this. I want us to keep this in mind. There are points, brothers and sisters, that we get ourselves in spaces. We're like, I, I don't know what's going on, but I know something is going on. All right, come on, let's read some more. Verse 28. <clears throat> then she said, did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? Now. At that point, Alicia knew exactly what was going on, right? I told you, do not deceive me. At that point, and I want you to ask yourself the question, was the Shunammite woman questioning God? Was the Shunammite woman questioning what the prophet did. I told you, don't tell me that I'm going to have to say it. it is fine. I've been living my life the way it is. Don't tell me I'm going to have a son and I'm not going to have a son. And you allowed me to have this son and now the son is gone. Does that sound like some of the things that we go through? Does that sound like some of the things that make us question things happening to us in our lives? Right? Why are these things happening to me? And did not ask you not to tell me. And she's telling it, and I'm telling you that there's one thing when you say it to your leader, there's one thing when you say it to your friend, there's one thing. There's one thing when you say it, even to your parents. But what about when you're talking to the man of God? How does that exactly work out? All right. And so as this, this happens, now Alicia has to jump to action. Come on, let's read a little bit more. 
And it says, Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins, and take my staff in thy hand, and go thy way. If you meet any man, salute him not. And if any salute you, answer him not. And lay my staff upon the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. Come on. And Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff upon the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he returned to meet him and told him, saying, The child is not awakened. And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain and prayed unto Yah. Brothers and sisters, I want you to understand about the power of prayer. Within the power of prayer, brothers and sisters, even the prophet of the Lord understood to pray to Yah. Now, I'm going to tell you there's a lot going on here. Him laying the staff on the child is one thing. Him laying his body upon the child, which we're going to read about, is a whole nother thing. But I want you to know in all the things that he did, he called upon the Lord. Remember that statement. In all the things you do, call upon Yah. Verse 34. And he went up and lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself upon him and the, fle and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house once to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times. And the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite. So he called her. And when she was coming unto him, he said, Take up thy son. Then she went in and fell at his feet and bowed down to the ground. And she took up her son and went out. And so I want us to understand what was going on here. Because as we find ourselves at that point, as we find everything that was going on, we see that miracles were being performed. We see that what was termed as the child dying, really, the Most High never killed him. But the people looked and they saw it. It was like, he must be dead. His mother thought she must be dead. The prophet had to do what he had to do. And I'm not here to talk to you tonight about what, um, what do you call that? I'm not here to talk to you tonight about what the sneezing the seven times is and its spiritual connection. I'm not here to talk to you about him laying on top of the child, eye to eye, mouth to mouth, and hand to hand, and what that connection is. Because that's a whole nother thing. But what I am here to talk to you about is the fact that when he prayed, that indeed was the catalyst. That indeed was the catalyst. I don't care how many staves you have or things of that nature. There was something that this man understood that he needed to do in order for this child to come back. And I'm telling you that if there's anything that this history has taught us, and if there's anything that this history has shown us, it has indeed shown us that what? Never give up on God. The question of when should always be a discretion question that says either now or later but at some time.
Brothers and sisters, to be continued, because when we get into this fifth chapter, brothers and sisters, I want you to read the rest of the fourth chapter on your own. But when we get into this fifth chapter, brothers and sisters, then we are going to get further into that servant Gehazi. And we see how in this chapter, he was a very, a very, a very good servant and did everything that his master told him to do. But as we get later, we're going to see that there's some things going on that should have never indeed happened. Open and praying that you got something out of what I said and that the Most High Yah found these words acceptable to be spoken before his people as I bid you all in the tongue of our forefathers. Shabbat Shalom Lakol. Brothers and sisters, once again, we thank you for joining us. We are Congregation Shomri Habrit and we are the keepers of the covenant. Just a few announcements before we give our final prayer, brothers and sisters. First things first, um, please join us tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Even as we have our Sabbath service, our lesson of inspiration will indeed be teach us to number our days. Brothers and sisters, our Sabbath service will begin at 9 a.m. Service will be virtual only virtual only brothers and sisters in this in this lesson of teach us to number our days there is the hyphen the calendar dilemma brothers and sisters i'll be talking to us tomorrow about our calendar and the dangers of having multiple calendars and how it takes us away from elohim also brothers and sisters i ask that if you are here and you're here for the first time, please remember to like, share, and subscribe to our channel, uh, Congregation Shomer Operate. Please continue to be with us. I hope that you've enjoyed what was said this day and you like something about what was said and may the most high continue to be with you all. Brothers and sisters, please rise and face the east. and Let us say our final prayer and our final blessing as we close out our Torah study. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We give honor and praise unto you, Yah, God of the heavens, the God of our forefathers, even the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Israel. We give thanks and praise unto you, Yah, for all things, for everything, even for blessing us on this holy Shabbat day. We ask, Yah, oh God, that you continue to be with us for good and not for evil, we pray. We ask that the things that we've learned this day, that we wouldn't forget. We ask if we've reached new souls this day, Yahweh God, that we prayerfully said nothing to blaspheme or profane your most high and your most holy name, but only brought them closer unto you. We thank you, Yahweh God, for the lesson of the Shunamite, Shunamite woman, as well as the lesson of our prophet, Elisha. That, Yahweh God, we ask that you continue to give us these lessons and cause us to continue to understand how to conduct ourselves and how our behavior should be. And have it to be, Yahweh God, that as we call upon you and as we acknowledge you, that you might be with us in such a way, Yahweh God, that we would always remember to keep our faith in you, that we would remember to always seek out our leaders and have it to be, Yahweh God, that your name might be proclaimed now forevermore. All glory, all honor, and all praise unto your name now forevermore. And let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where may. And brothers and sisters, at this time, I say the words of the blessing, even those words that the Most High Yah commanded the sons of Aharon to say whenever we gathered, asking that the Most High Yah might accept these words from my lips and that he might even bestow a blessing upon his people. Hallelujah. Yevareka Yehovah Yishmareka. Yair Yehovah Penaleka Wikuneka. Yisai Yehovah Penaleka Weasemleka Shalom. Yehovah bless thee and keep thee. May it be Yahweh make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May it be Yahweh. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. May it be Yahweh. Where Samu and Yisrael, where Ani Avarekem. So shall they put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, brothers and sisters, also another announcement. Um, brothers and sisters, Torah study, Torah study, Sisters Talk, 
coming up in the near future. March 22nd, 2024, their topic will be admirable ancestors. Join them as they discuss some of their favorite people in the Holy Scriptures, and they will be discussing their accomplishments, what they learn from them, and their relationship with the Most High Yah. Also, brothers and sisters, Passover 2024, Congregation Shomri Habrit invites you to join them for their Passover slash Feast of Unleavened Bread service. All right, please join us. April 22nd, 2024 at 7 p.m. Also for the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, April 23rd, 2024 at 11 a.m. Congregation Shomri Habri is located at 1568 Prospect Place, Brooklyn, New York, 11213. All right, brothers and sisters, once again, we thank you for joining us. We are Congregation Shomri Habri, and we are the Keepers of the Covenant. We ask that the Most High Yah continue to be with you all and Lala Tov. Oh Lord God, great King of the universe, God of our ancient fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Israel, we turn our faces once again unto the Almighty One, that we might shout thy praises, O Lord our God, and hope and pray that thou would find us acceptable. Even, O oh Lord God, at this time, and our holy shall not live. And we give thanks unto thee, because we are in life. And because, O oh Lord God, we have eaten and praised thy name. We have drank of our cooking beverage and praised thy name. And, O oh Lord, our God, we rejoice in the fact that once again, Israel, thy people, know it thee. O oh Lord, our God, how pleasant it is that we might meet even with thee on the holy shall not day. O oh Lord, our God, how good it is. Has 